sometimes it's not that black and white. For instance, when it comes to energy efficiency, we have a lot of new member states in the East who up till now have been extremely dependent on, for instance, imported mm -hmm. gas from Russia, and they want to be less dependent, and that is why energy efficiency is interesting. So there are two sorts of discussion. One is, can we increase the formal targets? Mm -hmm. That is going to be challenging because of the crisis, but the reality is that through very specific policies, for cars, for F gases, for energy efficiency, for all sorts of things. We are actually moving beyond our formal 20% CO2 reduction target. So you're sort of making the progress in behind the scenes to set it's, the stage It's not for behind the scene. It's, of course, very transparent. Everybody knows. But it's just to say that one thing is to have the discussion, should mm -hmm. we move the target? Mm -hmm. And then there are some countries saying, no, we don't think we should move that. We're not ready mm -hmm. to do that. Mm -hmm. But if then you say, should we not do this and that? Should we not improve energy efficiency? Mm -hmm. Because that could pay off. Mm -hmm. There is a good mm -hmm. economic case to be made. There is innovation mm -hmm. to be made. Then sometimes some of the same countries would say, that sounds like mm -hmm. a good idea. So it's just a pragmatic way of actually continuing mm -hmm. to move forward in Europe in the direction mm -hmm. of becoming a low carbon society. Sounds good. I saw one study that uh, projected that if that higher target were implemented, that Poland's overall economy would actually have a net benefit. So it would benefit from a higher 30% by 2020 target. So it's it's clearly it's not it's 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 like you said it's more complicated. You have to tackle specific topics that the country is willing I to think tackle. That the, tackle. The Polish government itself financed a very big study by McKinsey that showed that in the years after 2020, mm -hmm. there is a very good economic case for mm -hmm. Poland right. to be made in order to be more ambitious in this field. So um, things are, are complex, but mm -hmm. the reality is that despite of the crisis, Europe is actually moving in, in the right direction. Oh. And I think more sure. and more in Europe, we're also discussing not only how to exit the crisis, but how to get jobs created mm -hmm in exiting the crisis. And there more and more people realize that energy efficiency and renewables that also come, uh, that, that gives quite a, a job potential. That leads into some of the other questions. So, of course, Germany, Denmark, and even some other, several other European nations have faced um, a lot of opponents, a lot of myths, a lot of powerful uh, political opponents over the years while becoming clean energy leaders. And they've overcome the criticisms, they've overcome the myths, they've proven myths wrong over and over again. Um, so it's been a great success, but a lot of other countries around the world are facing those same arguments, and there's a, there's a huge disconnect. Um, the, the information is not being passed on very clearly to media in other countries, for example the U.S., but also many others. Um, what I mean, the current the current way media and communications is set up doesn't do the job because of the the structure of um, how these issues are reported on by the major media. So, do you have any suggestions? Do you have any thoughts on how that could be? Uh, I mean, working for a clean energy, clean tech site, we see the same arguments every day. That we see them published in major media sites. We see them on our comments mm -hmm. and other comments. And we know that they've already been proven wrong uh, several times, um, several times over in Europe. So it's a it's 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 a con continuous challenge to figure out how to communicate that to other countries. I think there is one thing we can and must do better, and that is to prove to people, to business, to governments, that to continue business as usual does not come for free. Hmm. Normally, for instance, finance ministers, they tend to sort of be a bit reluctant to say okay to this and that piece of reg regulation because to them regulation spells additional cost. Mm -hmm. As if, if we just continue to do tomorrow what we did yesterday does not come with an additional cost. But that is very much a false perception. And I think the more people start to realize that how many Hurricane Sandys do you want to pay for before you start to do things differently. If we start to realize that it's not a choice of doing nothing and then it, the cost will be nothing, and doing something and then the cost will be something. It's a choice between investing in the right thing to do, the necessary thing to do, the things that will pay off in the end, or uh, paying the bills for doing nothing. And, and, and the more people who realize that, the, the, the easier I think it will get. 
uh, it will be to get the decision through. It struck me this week when we have heard so much about the smog situation in China. I hear daily in my job as EU Commissioner for Climate, oh, it's so costly, don't give us more burdens, don't give us more uh, additional uh, taxes or anything, because we cannot afford it, there is a crisis. And I say, look to what is happening in Beijing right now. Does that spell competitiveness? Is that very competitive that you avoid it? to invest in a better climate, in a better environment, mm -hmm. and then suddenly one day you have tremendous costs to bear. Mm -hmm. So that to use that kind of examples a bit more proactive, I think, can also help to, to turn people's minds in the right direction. I think that's great. I mean, uh, for sure, that's so many, so much of the time when you see a new study come out based on how much, invest, how much it would cost to invest in a clean energy future, you only see that side. You don't see the, the other side of the side. equation, the benefits, the the costs of not implementing it. Uh, the yes. reporting is th it's going to cost this much trillion dollars, and you don't have the next part of the sentence that says, but if you don't implement it, it's going to cost more. And uh, I've seen several studies that show it would cost more. If and we also don't focus on the co-benefits. What speed. are the co-benefits for air quality, for instance? If you have more renewables, what are the co-benefits for health? Mm -hmm. Uh, there are, that but that is much more tricky. How do you factor in all these co-benefits? And that was why I ended my speech in there saying, we, we need to think a bit more across the board. There is still a tendency that we cope with different challenges as mm -hmm. if they can be coped with in one silo after yeah. another silo, after a third silo. We have to think across the whole board. Yes, I, like I said, that speech was wonderful. I love it. And that, that leads into this final main question I had. Um, uh, this framing of what clean energy is good for, because everybody knows it's good for the environment, or almost everybody knows. There's a few, you know, outsiders that will always live there. But uh, and of course, it's in, it's imperative that we communicate to people that climate change is happening, that extreme weather is happening now, and it's amplified by certain factors, like Jeffrey Sachs mentioned, the sea level rise amplified the effect of Sandy on New York. So I know this is imperative, but a lot of people still. Uh, what goes viral on YouTube is not this kind of thing as much as funny videos or cool videos or cute videos. So the question is, how do we how do we really open it up beyond the environmental issues? Of course, still focusing on it because I'm not of the side that says you stop focusing on the the disasters of climate change, but uh, on other issues as well. I know one researcher in. Uh, in the U.S. has done a lot of work on green marketing, him, him and his colleagues, mm -hmm. and uh, they focus on what has really worked uh, in different specific instances, like for example in Texas, the don't, mex don't mess with Texas slogan, I don't know if you're familiar, mm -hmm. are you familiar with this one? Mm -hmm. This is a very popular slogan amongst Texans, it's like don't yep. mess with uh, Texas, yeah. but it came from an environmental campaign, okay. it, it came true. from a campaign to try to find a way to get Texans to Li stop littering, and so they they focus on how do you make these topics more more macho or more focused on self-reliance or more focused on democratization of the energy system. What we are uh, trying to do right now in Europe through a um, campaign that we are running, an awareness campaign called uh, "A World You Like with a Climate You Like," mm -hmm. we try also to that really connects it to it. a positive vision mm -hmm. to say this is not about living in a dull and gray mm -hmm. kind of society where you must not do that and you cannot do that. Mm -hmm. if, if we act while there is still time, mm -hmm. then it can be a very creative world. It's smart cities, it's smart transportation, it's integrated systems, mm -hmm. it, it is uh, funny technologies. Mm -hmm. Uh, so we try to sort of also show the positive side, mm -hmm. a positive vision, mm -hmm. because it's always difficult if you want not only citizens, but also in the end for the politicians, voters, yep. uh, to go for something which they fear is taking uh, benefits away from them compared to what they have today. So I think that will have to go hand in hand, show why business as usual cannot continue, and at the same time try to to show how we can use our technologies, our ingenuity, our innovation forces in order to create a positive vision. A better life. Yes. And a better life for people. Thank you very much. You're welcome.